I hate having to enter. But anyway, hi, springs. This video is going to be about spring forces. Spring forces. Boing, boing, boing. Um, okay, so what did we just look at? <laughs> a little punchy. We just looked at a pendulum. And what we were really looking at was an idealized pendulum. The, the arm of that pendulum, it, it, we didn't really simulate the fact that it, it, you know, it, it couldn't bend at all, it couldn't shrink, it couldn't expand. It was just this sort of idealized rod that was unbreakable and perfect. Well, a spring is a similar situation to a pendulum, which we could represent as a bob hanging from perhaps some origin point. But instead of hanging from this idealized in, um, rod of fixed length, Instead, we have this elastic arm, this elastic arm that, in fact, can be expanded and contracted, and thus uh, a force is going to suddenly, you know, it's a spring. You pull it and it springs. I think you know what I'm talking about, right? So we could represent that by drawing this sort of squiggly springs thing. There we go. That's nice. Okay, what a nice drawing. Okay, so this is what we're working with. A spring. Now that we've established that, let's figure out how would we simulate this? How would we get this sort of springy motion oscillating up and down? So we know we can do this with, with, with the sine function, with a sine wave. We spent a whole video, a couple videos back, looking at that. And that's what's going on right here in this processing example, right? If we m take the result of cosine of an angle and map it to some range, then and we use that for the y value of something, it's moving up and down, it looks like a spring. The thing about this is while we have the simulation on the screen, it doesn't integrate with anything we've done before. What we really want is this spring <laughs> going up and down. But in addition to going up and down, a wind force could blow on it. Gravity could happen. You could bonk into it. You could connect other springs. There could be a whole set of forces all being applied to this object. So we need to look at, instead of just kind of using a kind of uh, trigonometry sine cosine trick, to make that oscillating motion, we really need to look at modeling a spring force. How do we do that? <laughs> Let's go over here, shall we? OK, so spring forces are modeled using something called Hooke's Law. <laughs> I wrote this down over there. Hooke's Law is, uh, in, in Latin is, which I can't pronounce, but maybe nobody can pronounce Latin or whatever, utensio sic vis. Translates to as the extension, so the force. And it would be nice if like the letters just of that appeared in front of me, but that's not going to happen right now. But what we're talking about is we're saying the force of a spring is directly, directly proportional to the extension of the spring, right? The more we stretch that spring out, the stronger that force. The more we contract the spring, the stronger the force. A spring at, at rest won't have any force. And Hooke's law is typically written as follows. F equals negative k times x. So what are these values? As with just about everything we were looking at in this series of videos about something, we've got a constant, right? k is a constant. You know, it probably has some real world numbers for different kinds of springs. But for us, it's just allowing us to tweak, tweak the behavior of our spring. Is it a really elastic spring, or is it kind of a rigid spring? Try a higher constant, try a lower constant. You'll see what happens. Deep breath. What is x? x is the displacement, right? We talked about the force of the spring displacement. Well, that kind of says displacement. The force of the spring being proportional to the extension of the spring. x is that extension. How, what is the difference between the actual length of the spring and the rest length? So this is something that's really important. A spring has a rest length. That is the length that the spring will naturally kind of gravitate towards at rest. That's where it will sit without moving, without springing at all. As soon as we displace it from that rest position, when let go, it's going to spring back and forth. So this is great. Now, one thing that, um, you know, I just noticed something about this formula. So this is going to be a vector, right? We're going to, we're going to have a spring that's in a two-dimensional world. Um, and so this is actually really just telling us the magnitude of the force. This is how strong it is. The force, the, the magnitude of the force, it, it, it's stronger with a high constant and a big displacement. It's weaker with a low constant and no displacement. But with, as with any vector and calculating any force, we need both the magnitude and the direction. How are we going to get that direction? Ooh, let's see, let's see. Ah, I think it's pretty obvious, right? OK, so let's think about this for a second. Uh, let's say, let me, let me draw this spring again. Let's say this is kind of representing the spring's rest length. That's the spring rest length. But we, we've stretched it out, and we've pulled it down to here. Well, what's the direction of the force? Clearly, visually, we can see the direction of the force is a vector that points back from the bob to the origin. So 
we're going to be able to do this. <laughs> we know that if we know this as a location, origin, and this we're calling the bob, and maybe this bob is going to be an object with a location, we can make a vector that points from the bob's location to the origin, and then we can calculate its magnitude by saying negative the display, negative the, some constant times that displacement. How do we know that displacement? Well, look at this. This, I would say, is the current length. Current length. So we have the rest length and the current length. What is x equal to? x is equal to current minus rest. What is the difference between the current length of the spring and its rest length? Here we can see it's, you know, it's going to be some number. <laughs> it's longer. You can see here that if we were to kind of shrink that spring, like push it all the way in, right? This is still our rest length. We push the spring all the way in. That displacement is going to be a negative number. And so that's going to reverse the direction of the force. So then that force would push it out. So you know, if you ever saw all of these simulations of stuff on the screen, which is like springing, bouncing, all this, it looks kind of cool. It's all springing. You think, oh, that's physics, and I can't handle that. Look at this formula. I don't think we've looked at a, a, a formula for a force this simple. I mean, we had like, you know, numerators and denominators and other formulas and Greek letters. This is really simple. I mean, I suppose the Hooke's Law is in Latin, so that was maybe a little bit hard. But, but here we've just got negative k times x. Awesome. And we know about vectors. I'm pretty sure we can do this. OK, now what I want to do is kind of start putting some code together that's going to make, that's going to simulate this spring force. And then we'll talk about a big question in it here is how do we really organize this program in an object-oriented way? And I am recording this, so I haven't wasted my time so far. <clears throat> you know, in that last video, the pendulum one, I didn't stop to say I was recording, which was a good thing. Okay, but and, and we've been going about seven minutes. Good. Okay, I gotta stop talking about that I'm making a video. You guys know that I'm doing that. Okay, hi, here we are. Now we're over here. So we we looked at this oscillating one. It's very hot in here. Uh, and I'm gonna close this out. And let's look at this one. So one thing I should notice, whoos, is that one thing that we should notice, I should notice, you should notice, we should all notice, we should all notice, is that the bob is now a mover object. We didn't have that with the pendulum. Our pendulum example, we kind of did in this simple way where we just dealt with sort of like the vector location of the bob and the vector location of the origin. We did some trigonometry and it moved. We really want to build this in a way that other forces, we could blow some wind on it and it would move. So that bob is a mover. It could experience gravity, it could experience wind, or friction, any made up forces that we had. But it also can be connected with a spring force. A spring force is just another force we can apply to an object. So somewhere, at some point, if we do this successfully, which I'm going to try to do, we're eventually just going to say bob dot apply, bob dot dad, bob dot apply force, uh, spring force. Right? This is what we're looking to do. We need to calculate that spring force and then apply it to our object. Can we do that? I think we can. So let's think about, uh, let's remind ourselves, the magnitude of the force is negative some constant times the displacement. OK, so f in order to do that, we need to figure out what is the displacement. Ah, forget it. Let's figure out the direction of the force first. We'll get to the magnitude in a second. Let's look at the direction of the force. A force that points from the bob to the origin. So origin is a vector. That's its location. Bob is a mover, and the bob's location is, ah, scroll up, edit, edit this out, edit this out. The bob's location is a, a vector inside of the mover class. So we can make a vector, I'm just going to call it direction, which equals, I'm going to subtract the bob's location minus the origin. OK, now we've got that direction vector, the bob's location minus the origin. Hey. You know what we need to know? <laughs> we need to know the current length of the spring, because we're going to compare that to the rest length. By the way, the rest length is just a nice little variable that's set up to be 200. So that's fixed here. This spring has a rest length of 200. We need to know the current length. Well, it just so happens we just made a vector that points from the origin to the bob. You know what the, the, the current length of that spring is? It's the length of that vector. So I'm going to make a variable called current length and just say really quickly, let me ask for the magnitude of that vector so I have the current length, because I'm going to need that. Once we've done that, I can normalize that vector. Now that we've normalized that vector, it's of length 1, and I can scale it appropriately later. OK, what do we need? Ah, we need a constant, k. I got one. 
I got one for you. I got a really good constant. Oh, it was going to be a good one. 1.1. 1 .1. Ah, that's not a good one. That's a lame constant. Oh, well. You think of something better. Okay, that's a constant. 0.1. I don't know. That sounds good. Maybe we're going to need to make it smaller. Maybe we're going to need to make it bigger. We'll do something. Okay, that's the constant. Now, 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 we need x. The magnitude is negative k times x. x is the displacement. I'm going to call it in this example stretch. I don't want to <laughs> ding, ding. Um, a, there's a bell ringing, which you probably can't hear, but it's distracting. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to call it stretch. The reason why I'm not going to call it x is because we kind of use the variable x to mean a lot of other things, and I don't want to use x to be displacement. So I could call it displacement, but I'm going to call it stretch. That equals current length minus rest length. Awesome. So we've got the constant k. We've got the displacement. Now all we need to do is say, all right, multiply that force, that direction vector, by negative k times stretch. That's what Hooke's law says. And then didn't we down here say, what are we going to do? We're going to apply that force. Now we called it dir for direction, but then we manipulated it. Maybe it would have made more sense to call it spring the whole way through. And I'm just going to, uh, if I had planned this out better, I would have just done that. Now we've got, we got this variable called spring. We did all the calculations. And now we're going to apply that force. And we're going to run it. Now, oh, well, let's ask ourselves a question. Uh, let's, actually, let's just run it. Nothing's moving. Why isn't it moving? It, we want it to move. Why isn't it moving? Well, here's the thing. The rest length is 200. And the Bob's location is at width divided by 2, comma 200. The current displacement is 0. We actually position the Bob at the rest length. So now we can see if this works by just, let's just put it a little further down, 40 pixels down. And we see, oh, it's springing back and forth. Yay, we did it right. OK, that was, phew. It's probably better if we did it wrong and we had to fix something. But you can see it's working. Now, there's some things about this. Maybe that looks a little too elastic. So what can I do? I want to, maybe I want to, um, um, maybe I want to, I'm sorry, maybe I want to um, make it a little, a little less. I don't really need to do that. You can see it's a little less. Like, so manipulating K will do quite a few things. But perhaps I just want to demonstrate that we could add other forces to this scenario. For example, and this is going to be kind of dangerous to do this, I could make up a force called wind which is just going to be some arbitrary value that I seem to use. And if the mouse is pressed, let's apply that force. Just to prove that what we've done is actually created a spring force within a world that can have lots of other forces, when I click the mouse, we see some win. Now, whoa, we lost it. Now, ah, maybe we should add, and it's kind of like going crazy, maybe we should actually add a little bit of gravity I, I didn't really mean to do this. <laughs> but I'm sort of demonstrating a point that this spring force is just yet another force. And we can see now, if I add a little wind, it blows. But if I let go, gravity's going to pull it back down. Now, there's no dampening of this spring. So maybe we want to add some friction, some air resistance, just sort of dampen the velocity. There's lots of things we can do here. But look at this. This is pretty great. We've actually got the spring force going. OK. Good job. Uh, we're, we're, this, I think this is close to the end here, but uh, I, I kind of want to ask if you have any questions. But um, OK, so here's the thing. We, we need to reorganize this code. This is a mess. I, uh, this makes me very uncomfortable, and I, I don't like it at all. Look at all of the, We should be suspicious of all of this code here doing all these calculations. I think it probably makes sense for us to actually have a spring class. So I just want to discuss that for a moment. Oh, here, oh, no, no, here I am. OK, here I am, right? OK, so we have this spring system. I'm erasing everything, which has a couple things. There is an origin point, which I actually might want to call the anchor. We can think of that as what the spring is anchored to. The spring also has a variable, which is the rest length, which is very important. It's obviously quite crucial in our calculations. There is also this bob. But we've already established that the bob is a mover. The bob is what is going to have location, velocity, acceleration. We're going to be able to apply forces to it. This is something we already have. It's the mover. So would, should we add a function inside the mover, which is like a spring function? We could. 
We could do what we did over here, which is just have a lot of gobbledygook code and draw and then apply a force to the bob. But I think a better solution would be to actually create a spring class. And then what would the variables of that spring class be? One variable could be the location of the anchor. Another variable could be the rest length. Oh my goodness, and I forgot something important. Another variable could be the spring constant, k. How elastic is the spring? How weak is this spring? So what we've done is we've said all of the stuff that has to do with the spring, that stuff in the spring class. All the stuff that has to do with the bob, that's our bob class, our what we've called mover in all of our previous examples. <laughs> We could call this one a shaker now, but that's kind of this weird inside joke that makes no sense to anybody right now except for me or a couple people watching this video. Okay, so what's missing though? We need a way of applying the, sp the spring force to the mover object. And one suggestion I would have here for that is we could add a function in the spring class called connect, which connects the spring to a given mover. This is going to be incredibly powerful because what it would allow us to do is it allows it to have a system of many springs, of many objects, and we could connect this object to this spring and this object to this spring. We could make the anchor of one. You know, this is a, opens another question. Maybe the anchor should actually be another actually moving object. We could have a spring without a, having a fixed anchor point. So there's lots of, this opens up kind of a can of worms of possibilities. But what this allows us to do, and I'll, I think I'll just show this to you in code over here. There is an example that I'm hoping is prepared right here in the draw function. And there's lots of some extra stuff. This is the line of code. This is now example uh, 3.11. If you're following along, want to go look in the GitHub repo. You can see here, we can say spring.connectBob. This is now a system where we have a Bob object and a spring object. We make the spring with a location and a rest length, and we make the Bob. And then, at any point, we can say spring.connectBob. So that's the function that handles, OK, where's the bob? Where's the spring? What's the current length? Compare that to the rest length. Calculate that force. Apply it to the bob. That all happens inside that function. And if we wanted to, we could just take a quick look at that. We can see this right here. This is the exact same algorithm that we typed out ourselves. The force is the difference between the bob's location and the anchor. We need to get the, the, the stretch, which is the displacement. Then we need to scale that force and apply it to the bob. All of that happens in that function. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with kind of nice, clean, object-oriented design. But I think this is, this is a really flexible scenario. A, a couple things I should mention about this. Um, one thing about this spring is you can see uh, this example, if you go look at it, it constrains the spring, so it can never go below a minimum length or a maximum length. I mean, that's sort of an artificial constraint, but it can make the system behave uh, a little nicely, a little more nicely, and it also um, has some dampening in it, and it also lets the user kind of drag this around. So now that we've looked through this scenario, I should really say, here's the thing. So, the next set of videos are going to be about particle systems, and then we're going to start looking at physics libraries. You know, a spring force is something that other people have thought of, and in fact, one of the libraries we're going to look at, Toxiclib's Verlet physics package, is all about spring forces and all different kinds of springs and making particles and connecting them by springs. So in a lot of scenarios, if you want to have a system of many connected springs to simulate, um, uh, like, uh, a, ch a chain, I'm sorry, a blanket, you could do you can do lots of great simulations with springs. Um, um, in, in many cases, you're going to want to use one of the libraries. So I would say play with this for now. When we come back to to when we go get to toxic libs, we might revisit this and kind of look, compare, contrast. Does it make sense to kind of calculate the spring force yourself in the code, or just use a library's kind of built-in spring objects? Um, but if you're looking for an exercise here, what I would suggest this is really a this is really a place where you can do kind of like what we said with the pendulum. Try to make a system of springs. And I'm going to describe two scenarios for you. One would be create a set of springs like this. And you're going to see it if, if you draw it just as kind of like a, a curved path, it's going to appear a little bit like string, perhaps. Um, and another thing you might try doing is create a grid of springs. So to create almost like a skeleton for some kind of strange, I don't know what I'm doing, structure. So spring forces, you, you know, you. Oh boy, you can do so much with them, and I'm not going to blather on um, because clearly 
<laughs> I should have, you know, because we're done. This is like 20 minutes already. So um, uh, hopefully this helped you. And <laughs> I can't imagine anyone's still watching at this point. But uh, if you are, I'm going to press the button now to shut this video off. And this, this marks the end of the oscillation chapter. We're going to get to looking at particle systems next, which is um, systems of many, many, many moving objects. Okay.